Mr. Schaefer, thank you so, so much for your time. We really appreciate and it's wonderful that you could uh, get in touch with us today. And uh, we are approaching very important data. It's 29th of March, 20 years already since we joined NATO. Uh, with other six countries, we were seven countries all together. And at that time you were NATO Secretary General and it was quite massive enlargement. And I would like to ask you first, how important and special and what for you does it mean to, to be uh, uh, at the time as Secretary General uh, and to give this uh, green light for so many countries? Well, of course, it, it, it was a very special uh, occasion uh, on the lawn of the old NATO building in Brussels, I remember. And I remember telling my wife who was there, uh, and she told me that, that, that we concluded seeing that ceremony and seeing the emotions, uh, the tears, literally the tears on the, on the faces of, of, of political leaders of the nations joining, that we had, we said to each other as Dutchmen, we had underestimated the emotion, what this meant to those nations until we saw their emotions, your emotions, so it was a very special occasion. Uh, uh, and we also realized that, uh, I mean, in this part of Europe, where I come from, uh, the Western part of Europe, we should know more, and that's as relevant now as it was then, we should know more about the history. Uh, let's take the Baltic nations as, as, as an example, uh, where, where there, there was domination by others. There was domination by the Bolsheviks, by communism, uh, uh, then the Nazis, then... Uh, the Soviet Union came back. I mean, your history uh, shows how emotional that moment on the lawn of the NATO building was. What you have gone through in the course of your history, uh, infringements, uh, killing of your independence, uh, and, and that's why I'm up till this very day very happy that it happened then in 2004. In uh, two year time, 2006, there was a NATO summit in Riga already. It was quite fast for uh, the new member states. And at that time, uh, Afghanistan was the main issue of concern. But how do you remember this summit in Riga, which was super special for us? But for you, was it, was it uh, also uh, meaningful that it was taking place in a new member state of NATO? Absolutely. And I remember uh, pushing very hard for it uh, as, as, as NATO SecGen, Secretary General. Uh, very, very special indeed to be there, to have the NATO summit there. Uh, our, our host uh, was President Vika Freiberga. Uh, she's a giant, one, one of the, one of the uh, female giants I met in my, uh, during my, my mandate. She was the host. Uh, it was indeed, uh, the summit was focused on, on Afghanistan, but the political signal also then uh, going to Moscow, uh, although the relationship with Russia was, was, was much less worse uh, uh, than it is now, it was a signal, a political important signal that NATO as this most important political military alliance in the world is meeting in Riga is meeting in the Baltic states, is showing uh, that the Baltic states, uh, every inch of them, are now part of NATO territory and that the integrity of that NATO territory will be defended with everything NATO has and everything we have. So the, the political signal going out there was, was of fundamental importance, I think. Is it still strong since then? Uh, from time from time to time, uh, I, I, I might I might come to the conclusion that it is not strong enough. I mean, let me be a bit self-critical as well. We we have we in this western part of Europe, uh, we have not sufficiently listened to warnings coming from the Baltic states, coming from Poland, coming from the Eastern European allies from uh, NATO within within NATO. Uh, that we should take uh, their position, your position, and more specifically Vladimir Putin and Russia more seriously. Uh, and and I, th I think in the relative comfort, geographic comfort, where we live in The Hague, 
or Paris or Brussels or Madrid or Rome uh, or Athens or you name them, uh, we should have listened more carefully. Uh, and, and the lesson uh, I'm drawing from this period is that also in our education, educating our younger people uh, who will be at the helm of state affairs before they realize we should do everything we can uh, to make that Europe uh, uh, a whole Europe, if you understand what I mean. That's why it is important uh, uh, that we keep the discussion on Ukraine and NATO membership alive, difficult as it is. That's why it is extremely important uh, that Ukraine has been offered EU candidate membership, uh, together with Moldova uh, and, and, and to a large extent Georgia. That's why these elements are important, but if you want to influence public opinion, let's take my country as an example, which is critical from time to time in this part of Europe vis-à-vis -vis, uh, EU uh, and, and, and further NATO enlargement. I mean, people should know and the younger generation should know much more about the history of your part of Europe because you are Europe. Uh, and that's what the younger generation should also realize. But then it's up to us uh, in our education system uh, to work on this notion that freedom doesn't come uh, for free, uh, that, that we have a, a horrible war on the European continent, a war of aggression. Uh, when Putin wins this war, if Putin wins this war, I, I, sh I should say in correct English, if he wins this war, it is the end of the Europe I have grown up with. You and I have known, the younger generation knows. It's really the end of Europe. So he should never be in a position and never be allowed to win. And there are the signals coming from... from uh, from uh, uh, the Baltic states uh, are, are as clear as they can be. That's right. Mr. Schaefer, in uh, 2008, there was a NATO summit in Bucharest, and you were standing uh, next to the Ukrainian president at the time, Viktor uh, Yushchenko, and you said Ukraine will become member of NATO. We found video about that. Do you think it had to be done earlier? I mean, Ukraine already had to be uh, had to join NATO earlier than we are discussing about it now, but it should be done maybe much, much earlier. But the problem was, uh, and that's why Bucharest was not NATO's finest hour, the problem was, and the problem is, let me add that as well, that there is no consensus in within NATO uh, about Ukrainian membership. Then in 2008, uh, you will remember, I do remember vividly, there was a big political fight, big political disagreement uh, between President George W. Bush, the American president on the one hand, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the French president then Sarkozy on the other hand. This was a political fight which ended in communique language, which read, I'm quoting literally now from the communique, they will become NATO members. And they was then not only Ukraine, but also Georgia. Standing next to President Yushchenko, I realized, I remember vividly, that I, I, I realized what's happening here, because NATO cannot deliver. We might write in a communique that Ukraine will, be, will become a NATO member, but consensus was as far away <clears throat> as it is now. Uh, may I refer to the most recent NATO summit in Vilnius, uh, where also there was language on, on Ukraine and NATO, uh, but it was not definite language. It was not clear language. And NATO will face the same problem in Washington at the summit coming July uh, on, on Ukraine and, and NATO. So I felt a bit in Bucharest dishonest with myself uh, because there was some hypocrisy uh, in that communique language uh, and, and, and the situation has not fundamentally changed or one might say changed not for the better because now there is a president in the White House, President Joe Biden, who is not keen as we speak uh, on seeing Ukraine joining, uh, joining NATO. Uh, so the situation was complicated in Bucharest in 2008, uh, and so many years later, uh, as we speak, it is still very complicated, and I don't expect, quite honestly, uh, to, uh, to uh, I don't expect an invitation for Ukraine at the NATO summit in Washington, 75 years celebration of NATO, 
uh, when when uh, when Allied leaders leaders will meet there in July. But in general, do you see that it's optimistic that Ukraine might join NATO at all one day? Well, I I I still uh, I still think uh, that that's that's uh, this discussion should be held uh, in 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 NATO. At the moment, of course, the situation is even more complicated and and very sad for the Ukrainians politically, because because the the, the Russians have an ex slash uh, are occupying uh, about twenty percent of sovereign Ukraine, Donbass and 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 and, and Crimea. So now the opponents of NATO membership, they have the argument also used by NATO more in general. Listen, as long as there's a war going on, Ukraine cannot possibly join join NATO. At the same time, the same NATO allies, and that makes me sad from time to time, are not doing enough to bring Ukraine in a position that they can win this war. I still don't see the Taos cruise missiles, long-range cruise missiles, who should be, in my opinion, uh, uh, earlier rather than later, being, being delivered by Germany. I don't see them. I do see uh, uh, Western nations whose fear of escalation has been, since the beginning of this war of aggression, whose fear of escalation has been stronger than the confidence in our own deterrence capabilities. Uh, and, 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 that is, and that is something serious. Uh, Putin should never be allowed to win this war. Uh, Ukraine should win this war. Uh, and things are not going well everywhere. I mean, Ukraine is very successful in the Black Sea. Uh, there, there is a maritime corridor for grain and, and wheat exports and, and, and what have you. Ukraine keeps the Russian Navy at the Black Sea uh, at, at a distance. We have seen uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO, which is a marking event events for those nations, but also for, for, for NATO. Uh, uh, Putin thought he would, he would round up Ukrainians and Ukraine in three weeks. Uh, he is at 20%, which is 20% too much, of, of course. So it's, it's on, on, on the ground, it's not going that well uh, with, with, the, with Ukraine uh, along, along some parts of the front, of the front on the land. Uh, but but still, uh, uh, we are not serious enough, including the Americans, by still blocking 60 billion a package of financial support. The same goes for Europe. We are still not going all the way and we'll pay a tremendously heavy price if we don't. Why? Are we afraid of Russia or we don't have resources or we simply don't want uh, Russia to lose? What, what's the reason of that? We do have the resources. Uh, uh, the European Union is a financial economic giant, a huge market. I mean, comparable to, 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 to the United States of America and, and, and China. So nobody is going to sell the idea to me that the European Union and Europe cannot pay up for Ukraine. Of course we can. The only thing is, as, 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 as is, is embedded in your question, the only thing is that, that there is no political consensus, uh, and then I'm referring to the European Union rather than to NATO, because NATO as an alliance as such, of course, is not directly involved and doesn't want to be directly involved in that war. But during my mandate, the same during the mandate of Anders Fogh Rasmussen, my successor, the same with Jens Stoltenberg, the present secretary of, of NATO, there, 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 there is no political consensus uh, uh, on the EU's or slash NATO-Russia policy. And Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin knows it and he uses it. He has the time. The Taliban in Afghanistan always told me, you might have a watch, but we have the time. Putin, Putin acts according to the same principle. He can wait and see how the US presidential elections go. How are the European Union elections going early June? Will there be a surge in, in, in populist parties? Uh, will there be more Putin addicts or Putin Versteher in German in, 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 in important voices in, inside the European Union and as a consequence in, 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 in NATO? So the, the lack of the consensus uh, is, is, I think, our major, our major impediment. And as I said, I repeat, the fear of escalation, which has been since the very beginning bigger than the belief the, the trust, the, the, the confidence in our own deterrent capability.
and th that's that's behind the German uh, the German reticence of of delivering the Taurus missiles. Heather, how to win this war? This is a question which uh, Ukrainians also are asking us when we go to Ukraine. And we do it regularly. So, what is the key uh, key thing to win this war? Well, first, first of all, uh, uh, to maximize our weapon support uh, to uh, to Ukraine, uh, we've gone, we've come a long way. I mean, we started, as you might remember, with flag jackets and helmets, and now, and now the Dutch, my government, and the Danes, quite rightly, uh, are are delivering soon a number of F-16 fighter aircraft. Uh, the Ukrainian pilots are being trained in Romania as as as, as we speak. So we 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 should, uh, uh, as far as 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 weapon deliveries and weapon support and assistance is concerned, and as far as financial assistance is concerned, do everything we can. I mean, to provide Ukraine with money and with weapons, uh, and 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 support them. That is that is what we can do, and that is what we should do. Putin can easily convert parts of his economy into a war economy. For democracies, that's much more complicated. Democracies are, are slow, they're fine, and it's the best system we have, but, but they are slow. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the political DNA of our European, certainly Western European democracies, is much more stability and peace than war. Uh, and I come back to the younger generation uh, again. We have to, to explain to them that freedom doesn't come for free. Uh, that the Roma the Ro Roman, the famous Roman saying, "Si vis pacem parabellum," you want peace, prepare for war. Uh, that is still extremely relevant in 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 our time. So, what we need to use a comparison is is Western European gene editing, DNA editing, uh, as is possible under the present circumstances. To, to, to make people familiar uh, not only with stability and peace, but with war as well. And we should win this war. Ukraine should win this war. It is not Ukraine's war, it's our war. But they are dying in the trenches uh, by, by the tens of thousands of, of, of people. We are sitting in the relative comfort. But what we can do is, is, is support Ukraine with weapons and with money. And that's what we are not doing enough. I want to ask you about boots on the ground. France said something on that direction. Do you think that might be a idea? I I don't see I don't see that happening uh, as as far as I can can see at the moment. I think Macron, President Macron, uh, brought more nuance in his statement uh, than the headline captions. Macron is going to send boots on the ground. Uh, I, I I could I could imagine at a certain stage that as far as as maintenance and training is concerned, uh, there there would be boots on the ground. Uh, let let give you the example. Let me give you the example that for the maintenance of an F sixteen aircraft, I think you need fifteen to twenty people around that one single aircraft for maintenance. Uh, who is going to do it? Uh, and and are the Ukrainians capable of 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 doing it? So I could I could imagine that that apart from fighting boots on the ground, where it concerns maintenance, uh, and that might well be what President Macron has 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 mentioned has meant, uh, that that we go one step further uh, than than uh, than what we have done uh, up, up till now, uh, but but fighting boots on the ground uh, I I I do not see, unless unless of course uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, would become over ambitious uh, and 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 threaten uh, NATO territory. Uh, I mean, at the moment, I think the uh, the uh, Russian army armed forces are not capable giving Ukraine, or for instance, giving it a try in one of the Baltic countries. But what what always could happen in 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 theory and in practice, by the way, is that Putin starts to create to sow unrest in Narva uh, in 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 Estonia. Where you have the Russian-speaking uh, speaking majority, uh, I mean, and 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 then tests NATO's readiness. He might test NATO's readiness at a certain stage. We now see <clears throat> Russian ballistic missiles uh, for half a minute, but it's still it's still relevant across crossing uh, over over Polish territory. I, I mean, I mean, those this might have been an incident. I don't know. I hope it was an incident. 
But Putin might test NATO at a certain stage. And, and that's why we should be alert and we should be ready. Uh, and, and NATO should completely go into the mode of, of, of deterrence by denial. Uh, so much strengthening is Eastern Front, including, including in, in, the, in the Baltic states, that Putin would not even dare to attack. Uh, and that's completely different from what we had. Uh, denial by punishment. Uh, we had the flags flying. Now we should have boots on the ground on the whole eastern flanks of NATO uh, to, to deter uh, uh, Putin for ever doing something again. I have a couple of more things, if I may. For you personally, 24 uh, February 24, when war started in Ukraine, could you believe to that? that it might happen actually one day? No, I'm, I, must, I must give you the honest answer that, that I, 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 I didn't expect this, although, although I have never trusted Vladimir Putin, of course, uh, met him a number of times during my active NATO days. I've never trusted him, uh, and I know about his obsession. I always tell my students at university what's the difference between an ambition and an obsession. Putin is obsessed by, by the phrase, I want my empire back. Be it, be it the Peter the Great, the Tsarist Empire, be it the Soviet Empire, uh, I want my empire back. I have uh, uh, the right uh, to consider Ukraine as Russia, as my own, to consider Georgia as my own, to consider Moldova as my own. The Baltic states basically belong to Russia and to the Russian Empire. Uh, and, and that is an obsession uh, he will have and carry with him until he dies or is deposed or, 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 or ends in jail, which, which I might hope at a, at, a, at a certain stage. That is his obsession. So I knew about this obsession because I've met the guy in, in, a number of times and, and he's the same Vladimir Vladimirovich as he was in my active days. So no, I, I, I must honestly answer, I did not expect him to go in in, 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 in February two years ago. Uh, uh, but when American intelligence services started to communicate out in the open that this was imminent, I, under, I think I understood, if I remember well, that, that this, this might be the beginning of, of an all-out war. Uh, but, but again, uh, uh, we were, uh, of course, unprepared uh, in, in NATO and in the European Union, unprepared for this massive war of aggression Putin initiated in, in that, uh, in that uh, horrible month of February. Yeah, if we're coming back to the previous question, so his obsession is so big that uh, even I think personally that NATO has a huge potential to fight against anyone. But uh, so would really Russia and Putin be so crazy to decide to attack NATO, knowing that it might lead to completely, I mean, disaster for Russia? I hope he's not, because, because Putin, Putin uh, can never uh, win uh, a war, a conventional war against NATO. Uh, that might take NATO some time. It might take some time for NATO, but Putin can never win a conventional war. He has been saber rattling uh, with, with nuclear weapons. Uh, but I think the Chinese have explained to Putin that, that uh, he should never do that. And the Chinese, of course, uh, Xi Jinping is the big uncle for Vladimir Putin, who is the young nephew. But they have this limitless friendship, <coughs> excuse me, this limit, the limitless bond. Uh, I think also the Americans behind the scenes have, have been making clear to Putin uh, that he should never dare to use a nuclear weapon uh, because the, the reaction uh, might, might be horrible and, and, and devastating for him. So I, I quite honestly do not think that, that it will come that far uh, and that Putin uh, is realistic enough that he can't win a full-blown war against, uh, against NATO. He would, by the way, lose the South, the global South as well in doing that. I mean, the global South, India, Indonesia, Brazil, the BRICS, and so on, they are uh, uh, not fully supporting us, the West. Uh, for them, Ukraine is sometimes a far away war, uh, and they tell us that liberal international order you are pretending to defend is not exactly our liberal order. The global South is winning in influence. 
coming back to my my uh, my 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 answer, uh, if Putin would would ref, uh, would would use weapons of mass destruction, I think I think or threat too much threatened with weapons of mass destruction, he might lose the global south, and China in 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 its bond with Putin, and we in the West of course are competing for the attention and the support of the global south. Uh, India is, in my opinion, a nation which could bridge the gap between the West and the and the global South. So that that is a key nation politically, in my in my opinion, uh, and 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 put Putin might also listen to uh, to Narendra Modi in this in this regard. We should uh, see it in a bit wider geopolitical perspective in this regard, where there will be pressure on Putin not to go too far. That's what I mean to say. Finally, Mr. Schaefer. The fact that Sweden and Finland finally joined NATO, uh, on your opinion, was it just a matter of time for these two countries or Russia's war in Ukraine was the main aspect why they decided to do, do that? And as a NATO, what do we gain uh, after both countries decided to, to be part of the NATO? Well, it was absolutely triggered by by Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. Absolutely, because uh, without that war, I I uh, I, th I think uh, uh, Finland and Sweden would never have made this for them dramatic move. Uh, I mean, look at Sweden and and its neutrality. Look at look at look at look at Finland. Uh, I'm very happy, very very happy uh, that they have joined NATO. I mean, uh, let's not forget, uh, they are both uh, highly valued partners politically, but also militarily. Uh, state of the art uh, armed forces, the Finns have never forgotten the 1939 winter war uh, against, uh, against uh, uh, the, the Soviet Union uh, then. Uh, Sweden has, has gone on in, in investing in its armed forces while we, uh, in 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 NATO, in NATO to a large extent, we're sitting at ease uh, and enjoying a geopolitical holiday. The Finns and the Swedes, like the Baltic states, geography matters greatly in in international relations. Of course, the Finns and the Swedes went on investing in their armed forces. We didn't. It will now take us fifteen to twenty years to rebuild our armed forces. We have we have woken up in shock uh, after the, the 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 Putin move inside inside Ukraine and and his war, so it's a it's a huge plus to have Sweden and Finland on board. It is a few a huge minus for Putin because if you look at the geography, if you look at the Baltic seas, I mean, I mean it it's it's now an in an inner lake of 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 NATO. Think about the strategic importance of Gotland, which the Swedes and NATO will now quickly militarize. So there, there, there are, as, as I said earlier in this interview, there are pluses, huge pluses. Uh, and and, and I, I enjoy very much Sweden's and, and Finland's accession to, to NATO. It's a huge step. It's a very important step. Mr. Schaefer, thank you so, so much for this interview. It was a great, it was a great pleasure. Uh, all, all, all the best to you. And thank you for being uh, uh, with you and on your show. Thank you.